our message, hasting to his coming, is taken from 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 to 18. As we come to the close of the year and the close of a decade, there is much to reflect upon in our lives. For those who are in their 50s, they would say, next 10 years, 60. Those who are in their 60s, next 10 years, 70. And those who are in their 80s, next 10 years, 90s. And those who are in their 90s, which we have our brethren here, wow, a century is that long. And as we reflect upon life, as we think about life, wow, we see the moving of time in the life of to have known the way of God through Christ, taking hold of His Word, imbibing the wisdom of God. Solomon says, For the Lord giveth wisdom, and out of His mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He, say, he layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous, for the people of God, those whom He has washed clean by the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. He's a buckler to them that walk uprightly. Tonight is a night for reflection, a night to think of the goodness of God toward us, to count our blessings, to give thanks for His marvellous grace toward us. As we see the families gathering themselves together, we give thanks to God for His grace. More than that, we said that Tonight is also a night of preparation. As we do, as we say this, at the close of every year, how do you prepare yourself for a new year, a coming year and a coming decade before us? What are your plans for the years to come? How do we make plans in the light of the life to come before us, as the people of God, would this be the year, or would, or would next year be the year, or next decade be the time of our Lord's return to receive His church to glory? Are we prepared to meet the Lord? How does the Christian prepare for the future? How do you prepare for the tomorrow? Right? As you close your eyes to nap for the night, to rest, you anticipate a, a new day that will come as you would awake, as the Lord would enable you. Well, we have three thoughts for you from our text that Peter wants to convey to you, firstly, in hope. In hope. And secondly, in purity. Verse 13, verse 11. And thirdly, in peace. Verse 14. In hope. The Lord tells us that we are a special people that is destined for heaven. How real is heaven to you? Do you know that you will experience what the Bible says, says that will happen? The idea of being gathered together with our loved ones the streets of gold, and the music of heaven. 
Is this real to you? As eternity would come? The book of Revelation says, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Because the word of God is true and its fulfillment is certain, we don't or we do not have the slightest doubt. We can encourage ourselves and others, no matter how tough your situation is, there is a preparation for the glorious life ahead. And so, Jesus gives these words, or the disciples pen these words, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But when we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. The people of God anticipates a time where we would be changed. We would be given a new eternal celestial spiritual body. And the Lord tells us that, you know, life brings with it at the end of that journey of suffering, of pain, there is a glorious future that lies ahead. And so, for the believers who have this blessed hope, there is a deep inner joy that is in the hearts of God's people, in the heart of a man at home with God in Christ. Peter, when he began this, Epist or this, his writing. Uh, today we are at the last portion of his writing, the second epistle and the last verses. But when he begins, he says in 1 Peter 1 8, he says that this faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, Whom having not seen, ye loved, in whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, he rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. You know what's the life that is with God in Christ is a divinely special life. A life where God's presence fills us to energize, to keep us, and there is that special joy that is unspeakable, can, cannot be described in our hearts. Life with God. For those in their old age, hope is to be alleviated of the pains and discomforts of a body breakdown. And then men would face the prospect of death the definite end of human life. Is that, all, is that all to life? It isn't, isn't it? Because the Bible tells us that when the Lord would return, He would make for us a new body. And therefore, the Lord tells us that we have an assured expectation even if you were to take the last breath, absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. Paul says that you are but asleep. A day will come when you will awake again. You see, we speak about these realities because this would be for every home right, when the moment of death knocks 
on the door of a home. And you find that suddenly life begin to take a different meaning, you know. You experience separation. And that separation seems so real, so permanent. Our loved ones leaving us, the bond of love suddenly come to an abrupt end. Is there no solution? Is there no way out? Because there is a way out, God has provided that way out for us. Therefore, we have an assured expectation. This is what the Lord wants to bring to us in verse 13 of our text. He says, Nevertheless, we according to His promise look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Now He says that this world is going to be decaying and finally destroyed by fire, that all your hopes upon this earth is going to come to a very great disappointment. And we are so helpless. Verse 10 tells us about that eventual event that will take place. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Fire is going to come and it's going to burn up. How frightening. You know, sometimes we light the fire in the home and then you let the stove cook whatever that you place there. And if you were to forget to switch off the fire and the stove cooks itself until the water dries up and then all that is inside it begin to burn up. Then you see smoke coming up. And if there are any flammable stuff nearby, whew, it catches the fire and there goes the flame. Wow, have you ever had that experience before? <laughs> I forgot to turn off the fire. Oh. Wow. Frightening. The burning fire. How it destroys all that comes in its way. Here is a description of the earth that is going certainly to be destroyed. And so where is the hope of mortal men? Seeing then that all these things, verse 11 says, shall be dissolved. Verse 12 says, the heavens being on fire. We have seen uh, fires kindled on earth, but the heavens being on fire, this we haven't seen before. How it will take place, it must be so massive. And, the, and <clears throat> it says, the heavens shall be dissolved. How is the heavens going to be dissolved? By the fire that is in heaven. So great must be that fire. And the elements shall melt with fervent heat. 
But the heat is going to be so, you know, if you have seen something burn, uh, <laughs> chak, chow ta, you know, chako, wow, how, uh, how burnt up it is. Well, the, the world that is this universe that God has created is going to be burned up. Man is going to die. And there is a judgment that comes, anticipation of an eternal fire that the Bible tells us. So where is the hope for mankind? Nevertheless, verse 13 says, we according, we, according to His promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Now, you turn with me to Revelation chapter 21. It's described for us this heaven and new heavens and the new earth for the people of God. John says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Revelation 21 verse 1. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no sea. And I saw a new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned to her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and he will be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. So it's a happy place, you know. The hope that the Christian has is that God will bring you to a happy place. No more tears, no more pain. You know, we can wake up in the morning and, you know, feel a little bit giddy before we would move out of bed. Right? We find ourselves having to wait a little while, stabilize ourselves before we can stand up and begin the day. Well, the Lord is saying to us here that for the believer there is a hope that we have. A new heaven and a new earth. A place that God would make and create for us. A wonderful place. And the Lord is saying to us that we need to take hold of this hope of the future. And this is spiritual, you know. It's nothing on this earth. It's nothing to do with the things of this earth. So Paul says, in Titus 1, 2, he says, In hope of life, of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. So the Christian lives with hope, looking to life in the future. You know that there is life in the future and it motivates you. It invigorates you. It strengthens you. You know, when you purchase an air ticket, you hold your ticket in your hand. That's the hope, right? that you would be able to board the plane. An assured expectation. You have an assigned seat that is on that flight. And I trust that you have an assured expectation. You have an assured seat to heaven in Jesus Christ. You have confessed your sins before God and the Lord says to us that 
there is a future day when our Lord Jesus will return to take his church to heaven. A coming day when he would rule with his saints upon earth. A day that is imminent, coming. And then we reflect upon the earth. Paul describes this earth. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. So you look around you, if you don't have that spiritual life and you don't have that spiritual understanding and you don't have that spiritual hope and you are not taking hold of it, then, you know, your life can be quite gloomy. You know? We said, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain until now. This is life we experience on earth. We experience sorrow, we experience pain, we experience sickness, we experience death. We cry when the burdens of life becomes unbearable. Where is the source of true hope? Dear friends, true hope is in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, because He saves men from their sins. That's important because the reason why there is this pain, there is this fallenness, there is this disease and sickness all over us and death is because of the problem of sin, the rebellion of men, the transgression of men. You know, there are three words in the Bible that describe sin. The word transgression, it means rebellion moving away from God. And the word sin, missing the mark of God's law, God's way. And the word iniquity, a crooked life, a bending away from the way of God. The people of God has this hope because we have been purified of our sins and we have this hope of the future in the presence of God in heaven. And so John says, and every man that has this hope in him purifieth himself as he is pure. So if you have a hope of heaven, of eternal life, of cleansing of your sins, then you would find that you will not have the, that desire to set your affections on the things of this world. You would live in purity. Peter says, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Peter says to us, when spiritual rebirth begins in us, it gives us the power to overcome sin, teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. You know, last is addiction. Addiction to sin. And the reason why this world is floundering and groaning is because of the disease of sin. And this disease is so great. Next year, we're going to study the book of Genesis. And Genesis records for us the beginning of Sin. Chapter 4, you see the beginning of polygamy. A man with many wives. Polygamy, a distortion of God's plan. In chapter 9, 
pornography is born. Chapter 16, adultery. In chapter 19, homosexuality. Chapter 34, fornication and unequal marriages. And in, verse, in chapter 38, incest. In chapter 38 also, the first prostitute is mentioned. And in chapter 39, the first specific case, instance of seduction. This is the state of the fallen world. Man has fallen deep into sin. And all this has ravaged the Christian home or the home. But God is creating through His Word, through regeneration, a way out. The Christian home, the Christian marriage is to exemplify the love of Christ. And the Lord is saying to us that there is a new life in Christ that brings with it the power over sin. Sin is that which causes sorrow in our lives, causes shame, causes fear. And we have been freed from the bondage of sin by Christ's power. That means you have the ability to say no to sin. You have the strength to live a life of purity. And the Lord is saying to you that as you anticipate the time of His coming again, how must we live? How should we live in the new year? In hope. In what God would give to you through Christ, you will have no loss, although your body will deteriorate. In purity, Peter says that you are to keep yourself unspotted from the world. Beloved, verse 14 says, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him without spot and blameless. The Lord wants us to live that life of purity and He wants us to be diligent in saying no to sin. You know that it will bring you down. You know that you will suffer the consequence of it. And therefore, and you have been given the power to say no. And so the Lord is saying to you, be serious. Be diligent that ye may be found of him without spot, without the taint of sin, blameless, cannot be faulted. Verse 11 says that ye ought to be in all manner of holy conversation and godliness. So when we begin our study in chapter 1, we are told how we need to add to our spiritual life. Remember what uh, Peter says? Add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and to knowledge temperance and to temperance patience and to patience godliness and to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness charity. Not only must you put away sin, but you must put on Christ. And these words are described for us. What is Christ's likeness? So in purity, the Lord says to you, 
in hope, in purity. Not only must we not do that which is evil, sin that destroys us, but we are to do good. Do that which is out of love for God and others in obedience to His Word. So, is there something that you can do for someone each day that will bring you a reward from the Lord? Well, the Bible teaches us how we can do so and find favour with God. So not only are we to put away evil, put away sin in our lives, to put on a godliness, purity, but we are also to do good, do that which is good. Paul says that we have been redeemed from all iniquity, Therefore, we are to purify ourselves or purify ourselves so that we purify as in to ask God to cleanse us so that we may be made pure and that we may be a people zealous of good works. In other words, there is strength in you to do something good. And you need, we need to do something to cultivate that spiritual life that is in us. If we have not been taking time to cultivate our spiritual life, then you find that we, we can't really do, do good, you know. We have this experience with visitation. You don't go to visit someone, to talk to someone, to do some good to someone. First, your own heart must be prepared. Your own life must be prepared. Your own house must be settled. And how important it is that the people of God must prepare And then we can be a blessing to the people around us. In purity. And the Lord wants us to live that life. In hope, in purity, and thirdly, in peace. Verse 14 of our text. Beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace. This word peace means, comes from a compound word that means to join and the noun that refers to things joined together. To make peace, therefore, is to join together that which is separated. Jesus Christ himself is our peace. His atoning work on the cross, the shedding of his blood, gives us reconciliation with God. That's the beginning of true peace in a man's life, in a man's heart. And therefore, Jesus says to us who are in him, John 16, 33, the last words he lives to his disciples. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, you will be pressed to the breaking point. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. In other words, Jesus is saying to you that if you abide in him, he is going to help you to overcome the pressing 
tribulation of life that threatens to break you. And I'm sure each one of us has experienced that this past year. Right? A trial that has threatened to break you. And you said that I'm in that state whereby, you know, unless Christ would intervene, we would have been broken. But because Christ has intervened, therefore we were not broken. Right? Christ ascended to heaven at the right hand of the Father, prays for us that we will not be lost. He intercedes for us so that there will be a breakthrough in every pressing need that is before you. In peace, the Lord is saying to us that there is a way out of this world's problems that come knocking on our doors, pressing upon our hearts, seeking to destabilize us. And so, verse 17 says that we are to seek the Lord, follow Him according to His Word, the wisdom of His Word, so that we will not fall from our own steadfastness. In other words, you would continue steady in your life in Christ. Steady, strengthened. So, he tells us, how can this peace come to us except we abide in Christ? How can we abide in Christ? The Lord says to us that, you know, we are to take time to read His Word. Take time to do our devotion. Read the Bible in one year. If you haven't read the Bible in one year, you can come and we would pass you a 365 Bible and you can begin tomorrow. 365 Bible. Read the Bible in one year. I can assure you that as you read prayerfully, seriously, God will change your life. Wonderful blessing of God from His Word. You see, God's Word is life. Life-giving. Just like the food you eat, you know. You want to eat nutritious food, right? So you look for the best organic, <laughs> we said, uh, uh, safest, best kind of food that will nourish our body, strengthen us. Same for the spiritual body. You need to feed upon the good words of God, the King James Bible that the Lord gives to us. Feed on the Word and pray. Seek the Lord. If you have any need, do you seek the Lord first? You remember our, our, our prayer verse that we have been learning? Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, should keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The peace of God that comes as you bring your petitions. And this text tells us that we are to pray specifically. If you have a a burden in your heart, turn it into a prayer to the Lord. Lord, I'm feeling like that. I'm facing this dilemma. I'm pressed here. I'm in trouble. Lord, deliver me. Specific, by prayer and supplication. That's the word. The word there means that you have to pray Making known what is the problem. So do you think about 
what is bothering you in your heart? Do you think about it? Do you take time to think what is bothering your heart? What is bothering you? And do you identify it, that fear perhaps, that something that is in you, that is causing you that distress, and then you are able to articulate it and give it to the Lord? If you do so, then the Lord is saying to you that His peace will come upon you. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, cannot understand how it comes, but you know that it has come because there is a higher power, the God of heaven, the creator of heavens and earth, the one who made you and sustained you, is intervening in your life. Is speaking peace to your heart so that you have strength to overcome. And the Lord wants you to overcome. May the new year be a year where you would say, Lord, I have overcome. I will not let this bother me anymore. I have overcome. In hope, in purity, and in peace, the spiritual way, the way by which God gives to us that way out. And the Lord is saying to you that we have the wherewithal for a blessed life for victory, for strength. And the grace of God will be with you. May the Lord help us. May the Lord bless the new year. May the Lord equip us with a spiritual understanding and strength to handle life. May the Lord help us. Let us pray. Father, we thank Thee for Thy Word. Thank Thee for the instruction that is out of Thy Word that we in the Lord Jesus Christ find hope and purity and peace. O oh God, strengthen us, bless us with Thy truth so that we may be instructed to overcome and live experiencing what by faith Peter described, a life with a joy unspeakable, the presence of God in our lives, the triumphant presence of God in our lives. O oh Lord, Bless our hearts that we may tarry with thee. This I pray with thanksgiving through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.